Well, I will kick things off. So welcome back, everyone. Um, for those who weren't in last week's session, my name is Anna Marie Rutledge, and I'm a climate outreach specialist with NIACS. And Leslie and I will be facilitating this final lecture. Uh, as a reminder, I'm sure you're all very familiar at this point, but please mute yourselves. And if you're using a phone, please turn off your computer speakers to avoid feedback and noises. So we made it to session six. In today's session, we will be wrapping up the course, learning a little bit about climate change communication and how to tell your adaptation story. And then we'll review your homework for next week. So first of all, I want to extend a big congratulations uh, to everyone here. Making it to session six means that you have completed all five steps of the adaptation workbook. And it's definitely a lot of work and we're excited that you've all made it this far. And of course, there um, may be some things that you're still wrapping up and things you want to tweak or finalize, but you should all celebrate the work that you've done on your real world adaptation projects. So when the course began, we outlined the five steps of the adaptation workbook, but what you can really boil it down to is these two questions. How might climate change affect the resources that I manage and what management actions could help prepare for those effects? And at the beginning, before the course began, there were a lot of questions and many people were generally unsure about where to start. Uh, so for example, what will climate change mean for me? What changes can I expect? And how should I respond to, to climate change? And the answer to most of those is that it really depends. Uh, there aren't any, there, these aren't simple questions and there can be no single answer that can be given because these variables are so complex. And it really just comes back to the place on the land and its characteristics and the goals for the land. And this requires an understanding of location, management history, and experiences and observations of the sites you manage to help inform your thinking on future actions. And so we covered some introductory information and helped coach you through those five steps, but the answers to these questions are ultimately your own. So now at the end of the course, uh, you've got this. We hope you feel better equipped to answer those questions, think about the specific effects of climate change to your project area, and start to identify adaptation actions. We also have evidence of your progress. So we asked you questions before you started the workbook, and then we asked you the same questions when you started step four. So the, one of these questions is the idea that you can identify viable climate change adaptation strategies that can be applied to your local area. And as you can see, a little more than half of you felt like you could, but now most of you indicated uh, that you feel like you can. So that's great and a big jump in progress. The other question is whether you can translate broad adaptation strategies to actionable adaptation tactics in your local area. And again, we see a big increase here. So now that you've all developed your climate change adaptation plan, you can download and use this plan to reference in the future such as informing a management plan or another document you might be working on. It also provides you with some of the science and research for climate change impacts and how that translates into your decisions behind actionable adaptation tactics. So just to remind you of, of the purpose of this course, we wanted you to be able to practice adaptation using the adaptation workbook process. So now you have done that and know how to use it and you will have these resources available to you even after the course. You've also used your expertise and local knowledge to apply these tools to your local project area. And you've documented your intentionality behind your thinking and can refer to this as you implement management actions into the future. Part of this process is also creating a community of practice. So even though we are meeting virtually, you've had a chance to talk with others working on similar projects make connections, learn new things, and help us improve this tool. So uh, thank you all so much for joining this cohort of practitioners thinking about climate change adaptation. You've developed a new skill and have a thorough understanding of the process. So keep using it and get familiar and comfortable thinking about climate change. There's a range of plausible futures, so please do consider using this thought process or the workbook again for additional projects. In terms of wrapping things up, we will be talking about climate change communication today, providing some instructions for finishing up your work in the adaptation workbook and sharing your adaptation story. 
And then uh, we will dive into our discussion session this week. We'll, we will be focusing on monitoring and climate change communication. So I'm going to start off the climate change communication lecture, and then I'll hand it off to Leslie to talk about reaching and connecting with your audience. So professionals are increasingly expected to integrate climate change into plans, documents, and activities. And along with that, uh, there is a strong need to both understand and communicate effectively to diverse audiences when it comes uh, to climate change information. So for example, you meet you may be talking to tim the timber industry, uh, small woodlot owners, wildlife biologists, tribal partners, or trying to reach the general public. And each audience will have varying questions, concerns, values, and perceptions when it comes to climate change. So the first place to start with climate change communication is to know your audience and what your community thinks. So here we have a map of trends across the US on beliefs, risk perceptions, policy support, and behaviors around climate change from the Yale program on climate. So in this visualization, 67% um, of adults think global warming is occurring. And it's important to keep in mind that climate change perception varies by location in the country, which I'll get into more in a little bit. Uh, and then there are also six audiences displayed um, on the left here, ranging from alarmed about climate change to dismissive. Uh, and the majority, 59%, fall into the alarmed or concerned bubbles, but almost a fourth of adults in the U.S. are disengaged, doubtful, or dismissive when it comes to global warming. We can also look at public perceptions. So the majority believe global warming is happening, that it's caused mostly by human activities, that most scientists think global warming is happening, and that it's affecting the weather. But it's worth noting that uh, not everyone believes global warming is happening, about a third believe it's caused mostly by natural changes as opposed to human activities. And a fourth believe that there's a lot of disagreement among the scientific consensus on global warming. And climate beliefs are important to know when it comes to communicating to your audience. This is obviously a national view, um, but you can go to that website in the bottom right corner and view perceptions by state, metro area, congressional district, or by county to look into specific beliefs in your project areas or where you hope to reach your audience. And here's another set of public perceptions about global warming, this time looking at risk perceptions. Um, and this is where perceptions really differ. So 40% say they're not worried about global warming and nearly half believe global warming will not harm them personally. A third don't believe global warming will harm people in the US, while this drops to 27% for people in developing countries and 22% for future generations in plants and animals. So in most cases, the majority is worried about global warming and believes it will be harmful in some way. But one of the most interesting points here is that many don't believe global warming will harm them personally, and that's something to keep in mind while framing your climate change communication strategies. And again, you can look at these risk perceptions by a specific location at that website in the bottom right corner. And then here is a comparison uh, between the percentage of adults who think global warming will harm plants and animals, and then the percentage of adults who think, or who believe most scientists think global warming is happening. And it's kind of interesting to compare these two here because 69% of the US population thinks climate change will harm plants and animals, which has implications for thinking about climate change and forest management. And yet, only 52% of people believe that most scientists think climate change is happening. So the main takeaway here is that there is a gap in how we are communicating about climate change with our partners. And here's an example of looking at these beliefs by county. So if you go into this visualization tool, you can view what your community thinks and get the opinion of a random slice of neighbors and the percentage of people in your county who believe each statement. So in this example, I selected Livingston County right outside Detroit, and I selected the statement, global warming will harm plants and animals. So you can see that there's a difference among the Livingston County, the state of Michigan as a whole, and the US. So overall, the percentage of adults who think global warming will harm plants and animals is lower in Livingston compared to the others. 
So this is a it's a great quick exercise um, that you can do to make comparisons to the national and state average, depending on the specific geography you're interested in. We also have some information about forester perceptions in Canada. So here, the majority believe climate change is currently having a significant impact on forest ecosystems and will over the next 50 and 100 years. And the forest practices currently implemented are generally not sufficient to face the impacts of climate change on forests. And the majority also believe that we need to create and design new forest practices to, do, to deal with the impacts of climate change on forests. So you can see that forest, foresters are generally more concerned about climate change than the general population, which makes sense as these are people spending time out in the woods, just like you, and they're able to observe change over time. And so now I will hand it off to Leslie to present the next set of slides on reaching your audience. Thanks, Anna Marie. So now that we have a better understanding of how the public perceives climate change and how people even in your field perceive it, how do we reach our audience in an effective way so that we're tailoring our message to um, people that's going to resonate with them? Next slide. So the first thing that's really important is to connect with the values of your particular audience. If you're working with somebody who's in the outdoor recreation field or um, the general public, think about what, what specific things they might value about their community and their forest. Maybe it's um, biking trails, maybe it's um, rivers for kayaking and canoeing or opportunities for fishing, or maybe it's just this like scenic aesthetic beauty and they like going out and, and seeing the fall colors. Listen to your audiences and listen to the public and, and listen to what really resonates with them in their particular place. So if somebody's passionate about wildlife, you know, you can talk about how climate change might affect local birds and make it as locally specific as possible. Not some bird off on the other side of the world, but birds that you might see in your own backyard or you like to see every spring. If you're passionate about winter sports, talk about how climate change might reduce opportunities for skiing in some areas. Think carefully about what your audience values with each communication opportunity. Another thing to think about is to focus on self-transcending values. And so what I mean by that is things that are beyond just the benefits to yourself. So we often think, oh, we can just tell somebody, oh, this is gonna be great for your, your income. But actually people resonate more with things that are beyond themselves. So instead of saying, you will make money if, if you do a timber sale or this, you know, saving this forest is going to help, help your income stream. Think about how healthier forests are going to be more resilient to future changes and help your community as a whole. And as I mentioned before, make it as local as possible. So when you're looking at changes in temperature or precipitation, don't throw up a graph from the IPCC that shows climate change trends across the entire globe, but rather spend the time to look up temperature trends in your particular location, whether that be for your state or for your city or county, and really focus on those specific impacts to your community. Um, People tend to use icons like polar bears when they're talking about climate change, but that doesn't really resonate with the general public because they're not something that you see every day. Rather think about animals and plants and people in your own backyard and how they're going to be affected. And try to be as specific as you can. So people tend to not engage with things that are really vague. And climate change can sometimes be very vague. So if you've got specific information, share that specific information. 
So for example, you could say that instead of that precipitation is going to increase, you could say, we expect that within the next 20 years, we're going to see a 10 to 20% increase in three inch rain events. And that's going to lead to a certain percentage of soil loss. Now, obviously, if you're talking with K through 12 students versus professionals, you're going to vary how much detail you're going to go into. But when you're talking to people like engineers, they're gonna to want to know the exact increases in those certain rain events with certain number of inches. They're numbers people. So try to tailor your description to your audience so that it's as specific to what they need to know as possible. You can also connect with recent experiences. So recent disasters often stand out in people's minds. So for example, a, if a wildfire came through your community or those polar vortex events that we get every so often, or if you're in an area that experienced a tornado or a flood or a hurricane, those things really stand out in people's memory. And so if you can connect that to your climate change story, that can really resonate. And not don't just focus on the bad things, but also focus on the positive outcomes that came from those disasters. So focusing on how coming together as a community helped overcome those challenges. And what can we do to make sure those impacts are less severe the next time around? Now, it's important to not connect any specific event to say, this happened because of climate change. We don't necessarily know that. There have been a few cases where there's some pretty good attribution, but more likely what we'll need to say is, you remember that drought that we had in 2012? Well, we might get more of those types of droughts in the future, according to climate model projections, rather than saying that drought was caused by climate change. But relating it to a lived experience can help it become more real to the people who might experience it in the future. Climate change impacts and adaptation is just one of the reasons that you're likely doing the work that you're doing. And so um, you can connect it to all those other co-benefits as well. And so if somebody's not really convinced that something's the best choice just to do in the, the name of climate change, you could talk about all the other benefits it can provide. So maybe you have an adaptation strategy around increasing species diversity. Well, maybe that also helps reduce other threats such as insects and disease and not just the, the warmer temperature increases that you're expecting. And as we mentioned before, people come from different backgrounds and have different beliefs. And so there are certain ideas that kind of resonate across the political spectrum. And so focusing on those might help you reach a larger audience. So things that tend to resonate well with people that might have more traditional values might include things like aesthetic beauty, responsibility, economic or energy security, innovation, tradition, sense of place. And you can connect those ideas to um, your ideas about adapting to a future climate. So for example, you might say something like, this forest used to be a diverse oak hickory forest that supported a wide variety of birds and was really important to our community and we should work to restore it. So that language doesn't sound like you're doing something radical. It is very entrenched in the values of your community it's very location specific. And so using that type of language can resonate with a really wide variety of people. Also think about who's delivering your message. Oftentimes that might be yourself. You are, many of you are professionals who have been working for decades in the field. People know you and trust you. 
And so you can be perceived as a trusted peer, somebody that people are going to, somebody that people are going to believe. You don't need to go out and get fancy media people. And I would definitely avoid engaging with politicians on this issue of ha and having them be the deliverers of the message. As much as I really like the um, Al Gore Inconvenient Truth movie, it's not something that everyone is going to really embrace just because of who he is. So think about those people that are really trusted and based on research, what we've seen are pe peers, people that you know well are a really good messenger for ideas. Also people from the faith community are generally seen as trusted messengers. Outdoor recreation organizations like Trout Unlimited or Ducks Unlimited are often seen as trusted information um, deliverers. Scientists, um, this can be a little bit trickier, but um, in general, scientists and health professionals are considered relatively trusted as well. And among scientists, um, meteorologists sometimes um, can be a really good deliverer for um, climate information. Also, it's important to focus more on your benefits and, and solutions rather than the doom and gloom of the impacts. So don't talk about all the bad things that are going to happen, but really focus on the things that you can do. So you might say something like, we expect that within the next 20 years, we'll shift from being a zone five to zone six. And that means we can plant certain species and you might list what those are. And here that would not have, here that would not have survived previously. Talk about that new opportunity rather than the species that you might lose. It also is a way for you to connect it with other work that you might be doing. So if intense precipitation events are increasing, um, you can talk about how it makes sense to invest in green infrastructure for stormwater management, maybe something that you were going to be doing anyway. So again, focus on solutions. And this is what we're doing in this course, right? We're looking for those strategies and approaches and tactics that we can take to deal with those climate change impacts. So we're talking about the increases in precipitation um, and the intensity of precipitation, for example, but then talking about how you can invest in best management practices, for example, that might help reduce soil erosion. And then, you know, connecting that with um, your specific management on the ground. So when you're telling your ad adaptation story, and this is what you're going to be doing next week, um, it can help you gather support, both institutionally and financially for your work. We know that there's never enough money to do the things we wanna do or monitor our progress. And so by telling a really clean, crisp story, you can help gather that support either through um, getting grants or for example, influencing people in higher level positions that might have funding available or the ability to reallocate funding to those things that are important to you. It could help you reach a larger audience. So perhaps you've really been focusing on working within your natural resources community, but by broadening the the scope of what you're talking about from just natural resource management to adapting to climate change, you might be able to engage people in public health or in stormwater management or just general people in the community that care about this issue. And it can also be a way for you to communicate key lessons that you're learning and share those with others. So what we want you to do is highlight the co-benefits of doing good management. We're managing for long-term benefits, 
and maintaining our ecosystem functioning and managing for a range of future conditions. We want to make it about the land and getting things done. In other words, meeting goals by taking action to respond to climate change impacts may ensure goals persist for the longevity of the ecosystem. So what makes a good story? We want you to get used to doing a few key things when you're telling your adaptation story, and you're going to be practicing this next week. First, tailor the message to the audience. So maybe the audience is just us who are delivering your course or your peers participating in the course, but if you think you're going to use this information uh, to talk to some other group, I want you to think about who that audience is going to be and challenge yourself to tailor that message to them. Follow that logical sequence of ideas, connect the dots. And that's what we've been doing through this whole course. Connect your goals and objectives to the impacts and um, your adaptation strategies and your monitoring questions. Be clear about your intentions of what you're doing. Include specific details as much as you can, but not overwhelming people with too many. That's a very difficult balance. But again, if you know who your audience is, you can do that really effectively. And then connect your actions to the bigger picture. Why are you doing what you're doing? Who's going to benefit from them? And how is that going to help you achieve your goals? So the example storyline that we're going to be following in our presentations next week is your place and purpose, which is what you did in step one, key risks from climate change. That's what you did in steps two and three, adaptation actions to address those key risks, and then those outcomes and benefits. That's what you're going to be measuring through your monitoring. You've already done this thinking. This is what you've been doing over the last six weeks. So now all we're asking you to do is take that and put that into a story. Anna Marie will explain what the assignment is. All right, so in the last section of today's presentation, we're gonna go over the assignment and logistics for next week. And this is one of our favorite parts because you all have a chance to share your story. You'll each get five minutes to present your project and five minutes is really not a lot of time so please try to stick to one minute and 15 seconds per per slide uh, and be sure to simplify 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 this is a really hard skill to develop and if you're like me you'll want to share every detail of your adaptation workbook uh, but for the purposes of time focus on telling a story be creative and focus on the questions What's your future vision and how will adaptation help get you there? And this will help you think more about your project and it's a good opportunity to practice picking out the main points and telling your story to others in just five minutes. So your homework is to fill out these template slides for your short presentation. And we will email these to you so you can fill them out and return them to Danielle uh, by Thursday, March 11th. And you can either do that directly via email or uploaded to the Google Drive in either PowerPoint or PDF form. And the link for that and all the details will be included in the follow-up email. Uh, and so this is the first slide. It will introduce your project, place and purpose and audience. And the key goals here are to describe what makes this project area special and to share the major management goals that relate to your story. And of course, you're welcome to customize these slides however you see fit. The next template slide outlines the top two to four climate impacts and management challenges that are most important for your story. Uh, the key question here is, how does climate change make it harder or easier for you to achieve your management goals or objectives? So here you will summarize your ideas from your adaptation workbook in step two, climate impacts, and step three, challenges and opportunities. The next slide outlines your adaptation actions. Uh, so what adaptation actions will help you address climate impacts and challenges? And what about these ideas is new or different from the business as usual management approach? And then finally, you'll summarize your outcomes. 
What are the key outcomes you hope to achieve through this project? Again, uh, please feel free to customize these slides, uh, but just remember to keep it simple, tell a story, and make sure to practice your presentation so it's a maximum of five minutes. You'll all have the chance to sign up for your presentation slot, and we'll be using the lecture and discussion periods next week, so Monday from 2 to 3, and Tuesday and Wednesday from 11 to noon Eastern. And the link is listed here and will also be sent out in the follow-up email as well. So be sure to fill that out as soon as you're able and uh, sign up for whatever slot works best for your schedule. So assignments for next time. Uh, for this week, you'll summarize your project in PowerPoint to share with your course participants. Please send your presentation to Danielle via email or through the Google Drive by Thursday, March 11th. And again, the follow-up email will include all of those details in the presentation template slides. And then you'll also finish up and finalize your adaptation workbook, including homework six by next Monday, March 15th. And then on the slide here, there's also some optional reading on climate change communication, including a paper on communicating climate change adaptation and resilience, as well as a practical guide to values-based communication. We also have a bonus, completely optional assignment for you all. Um, we would love to turn your projects into one of our adaptation demonstrations. And an adaptation demonstrations are real world examples of how managers have integrated climate considerations into land management, planning, and efforts. And all of these projects use the resources we've shared with you to test new ideas and actions for responding to climate or responding to changing conditions. Examples of these adaptation demos can be found on the forest adaptation website uh, that's listed on the slide here. And then we'll also share a template with you. Um, so if you're interested in filling that out and providing a few photos, uh, you can do that. And you can also request one of us to help write up the first draft and that's something we're happy to do as well. So even if you're in the beginning or early stages of thinking, a demo page is a really great opportunity to share your story and perspectives uh, for others to learn from. So it's something we definitely encourage you all to do. Looking ahead, this week we have a discussion session, so be prepared to discuss your adaptation tactics and monitoring ideas. And then next week, uh, you will all have the opportunity to share your stories. So presentations will start on March 15th and then take place over those three sessions next week. Uh, remember to sign up for a time slot that works best for you and attend all of the sessions if you're able um, to support your course participants and learn more about what adaptation projects others are working on. And I believe that's it for today's lecture. Um, are there any questions for Leslie and I? Uh, Leslie, uh, I have a question. Uh, it's good to know we have access to our workbooks whenever we want them. Is it possible for others who are also interested to access them? So they are your, your they're pri private to you. I mean, we can access them as instructors, but um, they, those are, are private to you. If you wanted to share your account with somebody else, um, that you trust, um, they then they could log in with your password. Or um, the other way to share the results is by exporting and um, sharing your plan. So that um, saving that as a PDF and then sending it as an email. Is the risk that someone intentionally or otherwise might change something? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So. Um, there isn't there isn't a way for that for for outside people to view all of the plans without also having editing capabilities currently, and we chose to keep um, the accounts private um, because some people are still working on them. Um, some people really do want to keep them private um, and just for their own internal use. And so um, if you are wanting to share your story, 
The ways you can do that are um, to, to download your plan from the workbook and share it via email, or take the opportunity to write it up as a demonstration page like Anna Marie had mentioned. And that, that way we can, we can share, share it. And I encourage all of you um, to do that if you're interested. Thank you. Anyone else? These documents uh, will essentially be like a living document that will be there pretty much until you get rid of the site. So as we go through and we see that we need to make changes in six months, we can go back into the document and edit to reflect those things that we need to see done. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that um, because it's associated with the course there's like a six month period where you can edit them and then I that's a good question for Danielle because she's more up on on that but normally yes like um, if you created an account and you created a project that's not associated with the course you could just continue to work on it whenever you want and update it um, as you see fit so there is an opportunity to create a, an account outside of the course with the Forest Service. Is that correct with your group? Yeah, you can, you can even use the same account and then you're just not gonna select create a project with this course and you'll just create a project. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. So you can create as many adaptation plans as you would like. This is just our first introduction for you all. <laughs> yep. But it's a great, great system. Thank you. Excellent. I'm glad to hear it. Any other questions? I'm really excited to see what everybody pulls together for next week. Anyone have, does somebody have something quick? With only two days to do it. <laughs> yes, well, it's just like three slides, right? So um, hopefully it won't be too hard. And if you, you know, we're telling you Thursday, um, you know, if, all hell breaks loose and you don't get us it to us until Friday. I don't think the world is going to end, but um, we're just trying to have enough time to organize all of the slides. And they don't have to be like the world's most beautiful slides. Do your best. <laughs> I know we're all busy. Well, thanks everybody. You need anything else? Feel free to reach out to any of us and I'm looking forward to your presentations.